Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. You know where that's found, don't you? The last page of the last book, Revelation 22:14. But the next two words make me sad. For without. And then follows the list of the folks that aren't inside, they're outside. For much as we would like to think that everybody's going to be inside, the sad fact, dear friends, is that outside will be lost souls in multitude like the sand of the sea. You'll find that in the same book, Revelation, the 20th chapter, verses 7 to 9. The number of the lost is as the sand of the sea. While there will be a great multitude within the city, they will be a small minority compared with the unnumbered millions outside in the lake of fire. But you know, not very many people are deliberately planning to be in that lake of fire. Not many people have gone up to the window and put down their money and said, I want to buy a ticket to hell. But that's where they're going. And the thing that makes me sad tonight is that there's going to be so many children out there. You say, what do you mean? Children in hell? Yes, friends. Children in hell. And they're not all going to be from pagan lands. I studied with you two weeks ago this evening about signs of the advent in the family. We found two classes of signs because two classes of children are developing. Those who are disobedient to parents they reach the point in disobedience where they become signs of the approaching end. But there are others 
In whom the eighth chapter of Isaiah speaks, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs. They're the other kind. They are the obedient. You know, friends, that's really all that makes the difference between those inside the city and those outside the city. There's a great gulf there over which nobody can pass. It's the gulf between obedience and disobedience. I want you all to pray for me tonight, for I have something on my heart. A few few nights ago I had a dream that impressed me very much. We all dream. If you're like I am, you forget most of your dreams. Most of them I never even remember in the morning. But this one I woke up with, and as I lay there and thought about it, I finally went over and got some paper and wrote down the thoughts while they were fresh in my mind. I'm not presenting them to you tonight as something because they were in a dream. And of course, I'll bring you a number of things tonight that weren't in the dream. It's not because they were in a dream that they're important. It's because they're from the Word of God and the testimonies of His Spirit. But in my dream, from a burdened heart, I was presenting some things to an audience. And I must share them with you tonight, friends. Because as sure as I stand here, I know that many children and many parents and teachers are going to have to have in their hearts an entirely different attitude toward this whole question of discipline, obedience, and how to deal with disobedience. And I pray, God, that we shall open our hearts tonight to be changed where they need changing. This same book of Revelation, in the third chapter in the 19th verse, brings us the words of the true witness. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, who is it that Jesus rebukes? those he loves. That's a queer way to show love, isn't it? Well, the only reason it's queer, friends, is because we've seen so little of the two together. Most of the rebuking we're familiar with doesn't have much love connected with it. And I'm sorry to say that most of the brand of love that we're connect, that we're, uh, that we are familiar with that we've seen in action, has very little rebuking in it. As many as I love, Jesus says, I rebuke. If Jesus were on this campus, would he do any rebuking? Apparently he would. I wonder if it would make him popular. If Jesus were to come to your home, would he do any rebuking? I wonder if you'd care to have him long, care to have him around. But that isn't all he says in this verse. As many as I love, I rebuke and and chasten. Well, as long as we confine it to that word, which is old English enough that it has rather a poetic flavor, it probably won't trouble us much. But what does chasten mean in plain English? It means to give a whipping, doesn't it? And that, too, is rather antiquated for many of the that live in 1962. But we've at least heard stories about it. 
As many as I love, I do what? I chasten. I chasten. And here again, dear friends, what little chastening people today are acquainted with has precious little love in it. But there's bushels of a thing called love that you could go through it with a fine-tooth comb and not find any chastening in it. I wonder what's the matter. Have things gotten better since Jesus sent this message? Or have improved methods of accomplishing the objective been discovered? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Oh, the object of all the rebuking and all the chastening is to bring what? Repentance. And do you know what repentance is? That's the thing I want to study with you, friends, as it relates to discipline. Repentance is being sorry and sorry enough to quit. Sorry enough to turn loose. Of the sin, the transgression, the disobedience. And that's the object of the rebuke. And that's the object of the chastisement. There are three ways that people can get sorry over sin. There are three times that that may take place. The last, the latest, is too late. When the flames of hell fill this world and lost souls by the billion are crying out, nobody then will think that sin was a good bargain. Nobody then will think of all the fun he had, breaking the laws of God and man. Nobody then will pat himself on the back and recount all the times he got by without being punished. No. When payday comes and the wages of sin are paid, Every soul in this universe, friends, will see that sin is a terrible thing and that its result is pain and sorrow, always pain and always sorrow. There's another way to learn it earlier than that, friends. That is what the cross of Calvary is for. Hanging there on Golgotha, Jesus experienced the second day. The pains of hell got hold upon me, he said. And looking at Calvary, you and I can see if we will look and learn if we will look that sin brings pain, always pain. That sin brings sorrow, always sorrow. Because if when Jesus took sin upon his innocent soul, it did all that to him, my friends, what will be the fate of the sinner that clings to it? And if when the Son of God was the one upon whom the stroke of the law must fall, if the Father 
unsheath the sword and drove it right to the heart of his dear son. Need we think, friends, that there is any way for human beings to escape that wrath and that sword? Looking at Calvary, if we will look, we can learn that sin brings pain, only pain, and sorrow, only sorrow. But so few look, so few listen. Now there's a third way that God is arranged. He's arranged it for little children. It is written in the word of God, the rod and reproof give wisdom. Proverbs 29, 15. Do you know what wisdom the rod gives? Why, its wisdom is in the pain that it inflicts. Giving someone a tranquilizer before the rod is administered would defeat its purpose. The purpose of the rod is what? To give wisdom. That was Proverbs twenty nine fifteen. And I repeat that the wisdom that the rod gives is in the pain that it inflicts. And why? Ah, oh, friends, because the child watch this point because it is so vital in our study tonight. The little child is not old enough. And his vision doesn't extend far enough to have any idea of what the pains of hell are going to be. Neither can he look back to Calvary and discern the Savior on the cross suffering the just for the unjust. He's incapable of doing either one of those things. Am I right? Oh, somebody says, well, that's why you just have to cuddle him along until he, get, until he gets old enough that you can talk to him and reason with him and explain to him some things. And until then, do the best you can and hope that he'll soon be old enough. But I'll listen to it. Child Guidance, page 83. But let selfishness, anger, and self-will have their course for the first three years of a child's life, and it will be hard to bring it to submit to wholesome discipline. Its disposition has become soured. It delights in having its own way Parental control is distasteful. And I must be very honest with your souls tonight and tell you, dear men and women, that most of you tonight started out that way. Most of you got your start toward hell the first three years of your life. For the men and women sitting before me, with few exceptions, have grown up in a generation that has become soft toward disobedience. Let selfishness, anger, and self-will have their course for the first three years of a child's life, and it will be hard to bring it to submit to wholesome discipline. Its disposition has become soured. It delights in having its own way. 
Why, you say, of course, every child wants its own way, precisely. There isn't one child in one hundred that has yet learned the lesson that I'm studying with you tonight, my friends. Because there's not one parent in one hundred that has yet gotten a glimpse of what God expects in this matter. This is the straight testimony tonight, and it's straight from heaven, straight from God's book. Shall we turn again to that text in Proverbs 29:15? The rest of the text is just as strong as the first part I read. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. That's it. It takes work to grow strawberries, to grow corn, but it doesn't take any work to grow weeds. Just leave the field to itself. The crop will be plentiful. A child left to himself does what? Bringeth his mother to shame. And let me give you the echo of that in the divine commentary as found in volume 5, 325. Any child that is permitted to have his own way will dishonor God and bring his father and mother to shame. Any child. Samuel would, my friends. John the Baptist would. Any child that is permitted to have his own way will dishonor God and bring his father and mother to shame. The reason there are some bright lights on the pages of sacred history, like Joseph, like Daniel, like Elisha, is because in early youth those boys were trained to put aside their way and take the way of the parent. And in early life, the parent is to stand to the child in the place of God. As many as I love, I what? Rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And it's going to take more than some Saturday night socials to produce it. It's going to take more than some palling of parents with children, patting them on the back and saying in a melodious voice in our home, we do this and we don't do that. The thing I'm studying about must be learned before the child has any knowledge of the reasons for it all. For I read, before the child is old enough to reason, he must be taught to obey. And what is it that does it? The rod and reproof give wisdom. Ah, oh, but somebody says, I love my child too much to cause him pain. My friend, do not lie to God. You love yourself too much to cause yourself the pain and discomfort of meeting the issue in God's way. And at Judgment Day, you will not plead your love and compassion as the reason why your child with you is across the gulf. Go to Calvary again with me, my friends. What is it that moves the heart of Jesus to go out into that dark night, to plunge into that black pit for you and me as the sword strikes to the very center of his soul, what is it that moves him to do that? Love. Love. But tell me, what is it that moves the Father's heart 
to unsheath that sword and strike his son. What is it, friends? Is that love? Oh, yes, that's love. A love that very few fathers and mothers today know very much about, friends. A love that will inflict the stroke that healing may come. Never forget that it's written in Isaiah 53, by his stripes we are healed. But remember, there is a time in the little child's life when there is no way to appeal to it. By that pain which is ahead at judgment day, or by that pain which Christ suffered for us on Calvary. And in mercy, the Father who on earth stands to represent the Father in heaven will take the rod and inflict the pain that the lesson may be learned when it most needs to be learned. <coughs> in the formative months and years of life. And there is no way to learn it since Adam and Eve broke the heart of God in Eden except through pain, my friends. It is written of the Son of God who came and took our humanity. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. But your children are going to learn it without suffering, aren't they? Do not fool yourselves, my friends. Do not fool yourselves. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. May I share with you something written by a Baptist minister? A well-meaning mother said to me the other day, I don't know what to do with that boy. He won't mind a word I say. I said, how old is he? She said, he is four, going on five. Then I said, and I didn't mean to be discourteous or cruel, if you can get along with him three or four years longer, the state will take him off your hands. And the state can make him mind. The state has detention homes, reform schools, jails, and penitentiaries for that purpose. And the state can always make a boy mind. This was not a pleasant thing to say, and it was not a pleasant thing for this selfish, sentimental woman to hear, but I say lots of things that I hate to say. It seems like somebody has to say them. Then I continued, a boy that is raised to disobey the authority of his mother will, when he gets older, disobey the authority and laws of both God and the state. That is why we have juvenile courts, reform schools, jails, and penitentiaries. And if a boy gets with the state to where you say your four-year-old boy has gotten with you, the state will either shoot him down or hang him. I heard an ex-judge say the other day that about 98% of the tens of thousands now in the penitentiaries of this country were just boys that wouldn't mind their mothers in the home. What did we read in Proverbs? The child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. I said, did you ever punish him for disobedience? 
punish him. I don't believe in punishing children. Why, it would nearly kill me to punish or whip him. I just couldn't do it. Well, I said, there is your trouble. You are not willing to hurt yourself for the good of your boy. You allow your own feelings to control you, and in doing so, you are making a criminal of your boy who later will break your heart. The best and only genuine love is the love that is willing to suffer for the welfare of the one loved. Some disobedient boy's mother sits shamefaced and with bowed head and breaking heart in our courts every week and hears the sentence maybe of life imprisonment or of death on the gallows pronounced against her little boy who wouldn't mind a thing she said. There was a little boy in one of the middle states a few years ago. I could give the exact location if I wanted to. Just like this little four-year-old boy of yours, he wouldn't mind, and his selfish, sentimental mother couldn't make him mind. Of course, when he was a little older, 23, his sobbing mother saw him ascend the scaffold. And as the black cap was being adjusted before springing the trap, she, sobbing, broken-hearted, got as a last word from her boy, an oath, with the additional word, no use to sob now, old woman, you're to blame for this. If you'd raised me right when I was little, but the trap was sprung, the little boy that wouldn't mind plunged to his reward and his mother swooned into unconsciousness. Yes, friends, sin always brings pain. It always brings sorrow. But the trouble with it is it very seldom, the sin, I mean, seldom brings the pain when the sin is committed. That's the insidious thing about sin. And that's where the parent has been given instruction of God to make short work of that deception. And it can be done, friends. The first herb tea that I ever heard about was willow tea and pomegranate tea. And there are various herbs that can be used, friends. They're not steeped in water. They're applied without benefit of water. And before I was old enough to remember the experience, but I've heard it told, I used to be running to my mother to get some salve applied after I'd had one of those tea medications. I wish I'd learned it all, friends, by the time I got to be three years old, and I wouldn't remember any of those disciplinary episodes. But some people are slower pupils than others. And so I had to keep on having chastisement for quite a number of years. And you know what I find, friends? When I got to the place where I didn't get those chastisement chastisements any longer from my parents 
the Lord found other ways of giving them to me. But as I look back over my life tonight, I thank God for the chastisements, those that I got on my bare skin and those that I've gotten on my bare heart through the years since. I've needed them all. And I'm going to need some more, I'm sure. But friends, I want to learn the lesson. I wish I could learn it all just by looking at Calvary. But I find that in some ways I'm like the little child. I need something that brings the application very close. That's what the rod is for. Whether it's applied literally to the little child or through the experiences of life as we grow older. <clears throat> David, and oh how he knew what he was writing about, put down by inspiration, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. Yes, David, look at David, friend. Oh, if there was ever a man that was chastised, David was. Somebody says he needed it, he did. Watch him as he paces the floor in his palace. He's fasting. He's got a sackcloth and ashes on. He stretches out himself on his face and pleads with God. What for? Oh, for the life of that little child, that little baby, the fruit of his sin with Bathsheba. The sentence has gone forth from the throne of God. But oh, David is pleading and praying. But finally the word comes, the child is dead. And David has learned some lessons of the terrible pain that sin brings. But he's not through, friends. He's not through. No. no. The months go by and lengthen in the ears, and then the word comes that another one of his sons a grown son is dead, killed by the order of another one of his sons. And the second stroke, stroke falls. And again, David knows whose fault it is and what's the matter. The things aren't over yet. The discipline is not yet finished. Look at him as he toils up the ascent of all of it, fleeing from his capital, fleeing for his life. But who is it that has dared to rebel and claim the kingdom and seek to kill him? His own son, another one of his sons, absent. And before that sad experience is over, the terrible news comes to him, Absalom is dead. And he weeps and wails and wishes that it were he. And yet another son must die before that fourfold stroke had finished its work. Oh, somebody says, is God that cruel? Sin is that cruel, my friends. God is merciful and full of compassion. But God is merciful enough to try to save us from that awful 
hell ahead. And by the lurid light of those leaping flames, learn the lesson, my friend, that sin brings pain, always pain. Sin brings suffering, always suffering. Sin brings sorrow, always sorrow. And it'll never be learned in this wicked world just by some sweet words and honeyed phrases. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Why, we've reached the time, friends, when a person has to be apologetic if he dares to say anything in the way of reproof. If he doesn't apologize before, he's expected to afterwards so that there'll be good feeling all around. What is it we want, dear friends? Oh, if there's anything my soul desires tonight, friends, it's to be able to say... When the great judge calls my name, behold I and the children whom God has given me. I pray that we may join together at that hour. Now, this is not a balanced subject tonight. By that I mean there is much that needs to be said, needs to be studied, to take in the whole scope. I recommend to you this marvelous book, Child Guidance. I recommend to you these chapters on discipline. Starting on page 222. The objectives of discipline. The time to begin discipline. Discipline in the home. Corrective discipline. With love and firmness. Evils of indulgence. Lax discipline. The child's reaction. All of those, friends, are vital, important chapters. You should study carefully these things and know that discipline is never to be administered in anger, with passion. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase. It's not to be done haphazardly, stern and strict today, and lax tomorrow. The program is here, and it's wonderful. But we need to get on on our knees and study it, and then like Joshua, we need to get up from our knees and go to work. Because there's sin in the camp, friends. There's sin in the camp. Now... There are those here tonight who are not children. They don't have children of their own. Their youth in their teens and twenties and older and older. They might think, well, this tonight wasn't particularly for me. I say to you, dear friends, there is very much in this lesson for you. I say to you, if you missed this lesson when you were three years old and ten years old, you had better seek to learn it now with all the intensity of your soul. And you had better seek for someone who will help you learn it.
you had better take advantage of every opportunity to learn it. It's far more important than learning to give Bible studies, important as that is. It's more important than learning to give treatments or how to hoe corn or any of these practical arts that you're learning, and they're important. I want to see every one of you young people in heaven. I want to see you inside that city. But if you have your own way, you won't get there. That's the way that seems all right, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And some of you, as I see you flirting on the edge of the pit, my soul longs to do something about it. What do I mean by that? I say to you, friends, if there is the slightest tendency in your heart to disregard rules, to take advantage of any situation to have your own way rather than what's expected, then you are flirting on the edge of the pit. And something must happen to you. One of three things will happen to you. You will either go to Calvary and down on your knees get such a view of the pain that came to Christ because of your sin that that sin will lose all its attraction, all its pull, all its pleasure, and you will not want it. Either that, or else if God sees that there's some hope for you, he will try to see that some discipline is administered in your life, either by human agencies, or by consequences, by sickness, by the awakenings of a guilty conscience. By something, God will seek to plunge the sword into your soul. That sin may lose its pleasure. Those are the two things that may happen, and if neither of those does happen and accomplish its mission, then there is only one thing left, my friends. That's the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth at Judgment Day. And then, friends, there will be no pleasure in sin. The dregs in that cup that were frothy and foaming with fun will be found to be bitter, exceeding bitter, as your soul goes out in the darkness of eternal night May we pray. May we kneel before God. Father in heaven, we pray with all our hearts that thou wilt rightly interpret to us the things that we have read from thy book tonight. I pray that every parent here may sense his solemn responsibility acting in the place of God to act as God acts toward sin, to be loving toward the offender, but to make no compromise with the offense. Oh, help us to learn the reason for the rod, not to get even with somebody, not to make somebody suffer, but all oh, that suffering may bring repentance, that sin may lose its charm. 
I pray that thou bless every child here. Whether we're little children or children grown tall, dear friends, God help us to learn the lesson of obedience, to love obedience. And, O oh Lord, if we haven't learned it, help us tonight at least to learn that we need to learn it and to encourage those who would try to help us learn it. Bless us all tonight with sorrow for our selfish, sinful, silly ways. Help us to see that the only joy in this universe is the joy of obedience to the God of love, harmony with the law of love. Help us to have done with these weak need efforts to get along with those about us at the expense of God and heaven. Oh, tonight, my Father, be merciful to us and show us Calvary. And may that sword which went deep into the heart of Christ separate us from sin and sin from us. May it go deep, we pray, deep, until sin has lost all its appeal, and our only desire is to love Thee and obey Thee and obey those who are over us. And thus may we be among that happy throng that welcome Thee with joy and go through the gates into the city, the pearly white city, we ask it for each one in Jesus' name. Amen.